Hi, thanks for joining us for our second discussion of Carl Van Vechten's Portraits of Artists. Our Van Vechten exhibition, Man About Town, closes on May 15th, and we thought it would be appropriate to celebrate the photos he took of fellow artists. Uh, since there are so many, um, we did break this presentation into two parts, this being the second, and if you missed the first, it is available on our YouTube page. So let me pull up my screen. And we'll get started. Uh, so here's a little backstory about Carl Van Vechten himself, in case you missed it the first time. Like many artists, Carl Van Vechten was a complex figure. He was born into the prominent Van Vechten family in Cedar Rapids. He developed an interest in music and theater at a young age. Uh, very famously, he left Iowa in 1899 after graduating from Washington High School. Uh, he famously referred to Cedar Rapids as that unloved town. Um, went to the University of Chicago, where he explored art, music, and opera. He moved to New York in 1906, when he was hired as the assistant music critic at the New York Times, and eventually became the first American critic of modern dance. He left the newspaper position in 1914, but continued to write and published several collections of essays relating to music and ballet. During the 1920s, Van Vechten became very interested in Black artists and writers. He wrote novels and essays about the sights and sounds of Harlem that really capitalized on white readers' fascination with Black cabarets and nightlife. Uh, he very much self-consciously positioned himself as the white voyeur and guide to what he viewed as like the exotic Black culture in Harlem. In the early 1930s, after being introduced to the 35 millimeter Leica camera, Van Vechten began to photograph his large circle of famous friends and acquaintances, which included such subjects as F. Scott Fitzgerald, Langston Hughes, and Gertrude Stein, usually in bust or half length, posed in front of backdrops. And if you see the exhibition at the museum, you can see he reuses a lot of these backdrops. So it's fun to see um, which figures he gave the same backdrops to. Van Vechten remained active, writing and photographing until his death in 1964. Uh, in terms of the collection we show at the museum, it's actually on loan to us from the Cedar Rapids Community School District. In 1946, the CRCSD received a large gift of 153 photographs from the artist. And then in 1996, this original gift was augmented by another 29 photographs from the Van Vechten estate, all of which have been housed at the CRMA since the flood of 2008. So let's begin. The first artist we'll look at today is Georgia O'Keeffe, who is, of course, one of the most significant artists of the 20th century, particularly renowned for her contribution to modern art. She is a Midwesterner. She was born on November 15th, 1887, on a wheat farm in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. Her parents grew up together as neighbors. Her father, Francis Calixtus O'Keeffe, was Irish, and her mother, Ida Toto, was of Dutch and Hungarian heritage. Georgia was the second of seven children and was named after her Hungarian maternal grandfather, George Toto. O'Keefe studied art at Sacred Heart Academy in Madison, Wisconsin. While her family relocated to Williamsburg, Virginia in 1902, O'Keefe lived with her aunt in Wisconsin and attended Madison High School. She joined her family in 1903 when she was 15 and already a budding artist driven by an independent spirit. After graduating from high school, O'Keefe went to the Art Institute of Chicago. She ranked at the top of her competitive class, but contracted typhoid fever and had to take a year off to recuperate. After she regained her health, O'Keefe traveled to New York City in 1907 to continue her art studies. She took class at the Art Students League, where she learned realist painting techniques from William Merritt Chase. While she continued to develop as an artist in the classroom, O'Keefe expanded her ideas about art by visiting galleries, in particular, Gallery 291, founded by photographers Alfred Stieglitz, whom you may remember from our first session, and Edward Steichen. After a year of study in New York City, O'Keefe returned to Virginia where her family had fallen on hard times. Her mother was bedridden with tuberculosis and her father's business had gone bankrupt. Unable to afford to continue her art studies, O'Keefe returned to Chicago in 1908 to work as a commercial artist. After two years, she returned to Virginia, eventually moving with her family to Charlottesville. In 1912, she took an art class at the Summer School of the University of Virginia, where she studied with Alain Bedmont. A faculty member of Teachers College at Columbia University, Bedman introduced O'Keefe to the revolutionary ideas of his Columbia colleague, Arthur Wesley Dow, whose approach to composition and design was influenced by the principles of Japanese art. 
O'Keefe began experimenting with her art, breaking from realism and developing her own visual expression through more abstract compositions. As she experimented with her art, she taught public school in Amarillo, Texas from 1912 to 1914. O'Keefe mailed a few of her drawings to Anita Pulitzer, a friend and former classmate, who showed the work to Stieglitz, the influential art dealer. Taken by O'Keefe's work, he and O'Keefe began a correspondence and, unbeknownst to her, he exhibited 10 of her drawings at 291 in 1916. She confronted him about the exhibit, but allowed him to continue to show her work. In 1917, he presented her first solo show. A year later, she moved to New York and Stieglitz found a place for her to live and work. Eventually, Stieglitz and his wife divorced and he and O'Keefe married in 1924. They lived in New York City and spent their summers in Lake George, New York, where Stieglitz's family had a home. As an artist, Stieglitz, who was 23 years older than O'Keefe, found in her a muse, taking over 300 photographs of her, including both portraits and nudes. As an art dealer, he championed her work and promoted her career. She joined Stieglitz's circle of artist friends that included Steichen, Charles DeMuth, Marsden Hartley, Arthur Dove, and John Marin, among others. Inspired by the vibrancy of the modern art movement, she began to experiment with perspective, painting larger scale close-ups of flowers, two of which are seen here. Petunia number two on the left was her first such experiment in this, followed by such works such as Black Iris, the work we see on the right, among others. O'Keefe also turned her artist's eye to New York City skyscrapers, that classic symbol of modernity, in paintings including Radiator Building, Night, New York from 1927, which we see here. Following numerous solo exhibitions, O'Keefe had her first retrospective, Paintings by Georgia O'Keefe, which opened at the Brooklyn Museum in 1927. By this time, she had become one of the most important and successful American artists, which was a major achievement for a female artist in the male-dominated art world. Her pioneering success would make her a feminist icon for later generations. In the summer of 1929, O'Keefe found a new direction for her art when she made her first visit to northern New Mexico. The landscape, architecture, and local Navajo culture inspired her, and she would return to the state, which she called the far away, in the summers to paint. During this period, she produced iconic paintings, including Black Cross, New Mexico from 1929, and Cow's Skull, Red, White, and Blue from 1931. O'Keefe split her time between New York, living with Stieglitz, and painting in New Mexico. She was particularly inspired by Ghost Ranch, north of Abiquiu, and decided to move into a house there in 1940. Five years later, O'Keefe bought a second home in Abiquiu. In his later years, Stieglitz's health deteriorated and he suffered a fatal stroke on July 13, 1946, at the age of 82. O'Keefe was with him when he died and was the executor of his estate. Three years after Stieglitz's death, O'Keefe moved to New Mexico in 1949. In the 1950s and 60s, O'Keefe spent much of her time traveling the world, finding new inspirations from the places she visited. Among her new work was a series depicting aerial views of clouds, as seen in Sky Above Clouds 4 from 1965. In 1970, a retrospective of her work at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York City renewed her popularity, especially among members of the burgeoning feminist art movement. In her later years, O'Keefe suffered from macular degeneration and began to lose her eyesight. As a result of her failing vision, she painted her last unassisted oil painting in 1972, but her urge to create didn't falter. With the help of assistance, she continued to make art, and she wrote the best-selling book, Georgia O'Keeffe, in 1976. Quote, I can see what I want to paint, she said at the age of 90. The thing that makes you want to create is still there. O'Keeffe died on March 6, 1986, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and her ashes were scattered at Cerro Padonal, which is depicted in several of her paintings. Our next artist is Giorgio de Chirico. Uh, born in 1888. DiCirico was an Italian artist and writer born in Greece, um, particularly Volos, Greece, to Italian parents. His father was an engineer working on the construction of the Greek railway system, and his mother was a noblewoman of Genoese heritage. His parents encouraged his artistic development, and from a young age, he took a strong interest in Greek mythology, perhaps because Volos was the port the Argonauts were supposed to have set sail from to retrieve the Golden Fleece in Greek mythology. 
From 1903 to 1905, did Chirico studied at the Higher School of Fine Arts in Athens. Upon his father's death in 05, the family moved, visited Florence, Italy before moving to Munich the following year. De Chirico enrolled at the Academy of Fine Arts there and developed a strong interest in symbolist artists like German Max Klingerand and particularly the Swiss painter Honor Bucklin. He left Munich before graduating to rejoin his family in Milan in March of 1910. Shortly thereafter, he moved to Florence and via Italian writer Giovanni Papini, began to study German philosophers like Friedrich Nietzsche, Schopenhauer, and Otto Weininger. De Chirico attempted to relate the work of these men to his painting, seeking to transcend the banal appearances of everyday life and uncover the reality that he believed was concealed beneath. There were historical, mythological, and philosophical themes in De Chirico's paintings throughout his career. He began his Metaphysical Town Square series with the work we see here, Enigma of an Autumn Afternoon from 1909. This was painted while he was in Florence. During this period, which lasted until 1919, there are reoccurring references to memory, loss, mystery, the passing of time, and architecture, particularly arches and flowers, <clears throat> excuse me, in desolate, melancholic squares and cityscapes. They appear to be images of depopulated Mediterranean cities in a time beyond history, where everyday life is imbued with mythology. De Chirico and his mother moved to Paris to join his brother in July of 1911, passing through Turin along the way. De Chirico had been interested in this city as it was the place where Nietzsche had displayed his first signs of madness in 1889. The architecture of piazzas and archways made considerable impact on him, and locations in the city can be spotted throughout his paintings from this period, including this Piazza d'Italia from 1913 and The Song of Love from 1914. In May 1915, De Chirico and his brother were enlisted into the Italian army to fight in World War I. Based in Ferrara, De Chirico continued to paint with the arches and shop windows of the city appearing in his works. He had begun to use mannequins in the paintings he painted in Paris, and these became more frequent in his Ferrara paintings. In 1917, a nervous condition forced him into an Italian hospital where he continued to work, producing pictures mainly featuring cluttered interiors in the metaphysical style. In the hospital, he met Carlo Cara, and though their exchanges on metaphysical art or pittura metaphysica were born. In early 1919, De Chirico had his first solo show at the Galleria Bragalia in Rome. De Chirico's later period of work is said to have started in 1919 and lasted until his death in 1978. The Disquieting Muses from 1947, seen here, uh, is an excellent example of his mature style. Soon after his first solo show, he had a revelation while contemplating a Titian painting at Rome's Galleria Borghese. He wrote The Return of Craftsmanship, an article that advocated a return to traditional methods and iconography, while simultaneously launching an outspoken campaign against modern art. Previously, De Chirico had not taken much interest in technique. Despite his training, his early figurative work revealed an underdeveloped knowledge of anatomy, he sought to remedy this while in Rome, particularly between 1919 and 1924, where he worked on his technique and was inspired by the old masters. Our third artist, Horace Pippin, born in 1888 and died in 1946. Horace Pippin was born in Westchester, Pennsylvania on February 22nd, 1888 to Horace and Harriet Johnson Pippin. His grandparents had been enslaved. When he was two years old, his family moved to Goshen, New York. Pippin began to draw at an early age and in 1898 won a box of crayons in a contest sponsored by an art supplier. The following year, the family moved to Middletown, New York, where Pippin's mother took a position as a domestic. After completing the eighth grade in 1902, he moved to New Jersey and eventually found steady work as a hotel porter, a storage company mover, and as an iron molder. In 1917, Pippin enlisted in the 15th Regiment of the New York National Guard, later known as the Army's 369th Infantry Regiment, an all-Black unit that saw active duty in France. A sniper shot Pippin in the right shoulder, permanently disabling his arm. Shortly after his return to the United States in January 19, 1919, he received an honorable discharge and a disability pension. In 1920, he married a laundress named Jenny Ora Featherstone Wade Giles and moved to her home in Westchester, Pennsylvania. 
Unable to perform manual labor, Pippin worked at odd jobs to supplement his pension and began to paint cigar boxes. In 1925, he began to experiment with pyrography, burning imagery into wood panels with a heated metallic point. He ex executed his first oil painting in 1928 and over the next decade produced one to four paintings a year. The Old Mill from 1930 is an excellent example of his style during this period. Pippin attracted the attention of N.C. Wyeth and Christian Brinton, who arranged for him to have his first solo exhibition at the Westchester Community Center in 1937. He attracted national attention in 1938 when four of his paintings were included in the traveling exhibition Masters of Popular Painting, organized by the Museum of Modern Art. The Getaway from 1939 is one of his most famous paintings from this period. Late in that same year, he met Robert Carlin, owner of the Robert Carlin Galleries in Philadelphia, who became his dealer. Carlin introduced Pippin to the noted collector Albert Coombs Barnes, who bought a number of his paintings. After a very successful exhibition at the Carlin Galleries in 1940, Pippin began to produce about 15 paintings a year. One second. Two of his later works, Sunday Morning Breakfast from 1943 on the left and School Studies, 1944 on the right. Uh, for the next six years, his work was widely exhibited throughout the country and inquired, acquired by important museums and collectors. Pippin died of a stroke on July 6th, 1946. His rise to fame directly paralleled the folk art revival of the 1930s. Pippin was entirely self-taught and painted in a non-academic linear style that was characterized by a powerful sense of design and an expressive use of color. His works are decorative and highly stylized. He painted a wide range of subjects from African-American genre scenes, portraits, and biblical scenes to politically charged historical paintings such as John Brown going to his hanging. Pippin drew his imagery from such diverse sources as films, Courier and Ive prints, and early American paintings like those by Edward Hicks and Winslow Homer. His modern folk art style defies classification. Our next painter, this is Pavel Chelichu, born 1898 and died in 1957. Uh, Pavel Chelichu was a painter, printmaker, and draftsman, uh, also a stage designer, best known for his imaginative surrealist concoctions of geometric abstractions and stretches of landscape superimposed onto biomorphic forms. His work synthesizes mystical, erotic, and highly symbolic imagery to experiment with the nature of objecthood, painting modern life in the 20th century. Chelichu was born in Kaluga, Russia, to a noble family of landowners in 1898. He received private tutelage before his family was forced to flee the Russian Revolution to Kiev in 1918, where he studied under Alexandra Alexandrovna Exter, also known as Alexandra Exter, at the Kiev Academy. He produced stage sets in Kiev, Odessa, and Berlin before moving to Paris in 1923, where he was welcomed by the center of intellectual discourse of the avant-garde, Gertrude Stein. Chelichu's work developed cubist and surrealist tendencies, and he formed a small movement of artists known as the neo-humanists, which include Andre Lansky, Christian Berard, and Eugène Berman. He collaborated with Sergei Diaghilev and George Balanchine, producing stage designs with increasing levels of fantasy and metaphysical forms. Moving to New York in the 1930s, he produced illustrations for View magazine, which was spearheaded by Chelichu's partner, Charles Henri Ford contributing to Surrealism's debut in the United States. He became known for his portraits and paintings, which he developed through a complex matrix of symbols and references to the aesthetic of circus culture, as we see here in the concert from 1933, uh, and also bullfighting or anatomical studies of musculature and the neurological system. So keep those in mind as we go through these. Uh, this is probably the most representative piece of his that I've pulled for this presentation. And then we get much more biomorphic here. This is hide and seek um, from 1940 to 42. Awesome. His work with color and texture is really phenomenal. And you can see there is a very wide range to the effects that he can produce. Uh, dealing with the human body is something that comes up a lot in his work. This is anatomical painting from 1946, um, and it's something that he returns to again and again in his career. 
Chalichu became an American citizen in 1952, but continued to live an international lifestyle. He spent much of his time in Italy, France, and Germany. His work appeared in one of the Museum of Modern Art's earliest exhibitions in 1930, along with Picasso, Matisse, Miro, and Clay. His works can be found at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Art Institute of Chicago, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and the Courtauld Gallery in London, among others. Uh, this is one of his most famous pieces, Skull from 1950, and he does a number of works that are different takes on this with a kind of topographical map approach to the human face is something that he works with again and again. And the last artist we will talk about this afternoon is Richmond Barté, born in 1901 and died in 1989. Uh, Richmond Barté was a Harlem Renaissance sculptor who approached art making as a spiritual endeavor. He believed that if an artist considered how an object felt rather than how it looked, then his hands could execute the sculpture with little interference from his conscious mind. During his 60 year career, Barté received numerous prestigious awards for his art, including Rosenwald and Guggenheim fellowships. Considered by critics to be one of the leading moderns of his time, Barté's sculpture bridges the gap between realism and abstraction. Growing up alone, excuse me, growing up along the Mississippi Gulf Coast, Barté was frequently sick and enjoyed art as a diversion. As his talent became more evident, supporters raised money to fund his enrollment at the Art Institute of Chicago, one of only two art academies that accepted African-American students at that time. In Chicago, Barté attended classes with his friend and classmate, Ellis Wilson, and also undertook private instruction with notable independent teachers, including Archibald Motley Jr., all the while working multiple jobs to make ends meet. Following his graduation from the Institute in 1929, Barté relocated to New York City, where he established a studio in Harlem. Immersing himself in the cultural renaissance flourishing there, he developed a reputation among scholars of the New Negro movement, including Ellen Locke, who became a passionate collector and promoter of his work, as well as, po as, well as poet Langston Hughes. Um, Boy with a Broom, this plaster work that we're looking at here, is a good example of one of his early pieces from this time in Harlem. Barté established himself in New York with his inclusion in the first of the large African-American group exhibitions of the Harmon Foundation in 1928. He caught the attention of the larger art world with his first solo exhibition, at the Women's City Club in Chicago in June of 1930, and a subsequent solo exhibition at the Women's City Club of New York in 1931. The newly opened Whitney Museum of American Art acquired his 1930 plaster of Blackberry Woman and made two casts of the bronze in 1932. Like many of his fellow artists, however, Barté struggled to make a living through the depression, but managed to stay on in New York. His sculptures were an integral part of the inaugural exhibition of the Caz Delbo Gallery at the Rockefeller Center, shown alongside paintings by Manet, Matisse, Picasso, and Pizarro. Barté would continue to work in New York through 1947 and established himself as one of the leading American sculptors of the modern period. Barté was open to studying and depicting peoples of all races, creeds, and demographics. Eager to understand the nature of societies and the individuals who function within them, he sought to capture the spiritual essence of his subjects. For me, he said, there is no Negro art, only art. I have not limited myself to Negro subjects. It makes no difference in my approach to the subject matter, whether I am to model a Scandinavian or an African dancer. However, he is best known for and for the allegorical and genre figures of African-Americans executed during the 30s and 40s. Works inspired by his Christian faith, interest in African lore, and fascination with theater and dance. This is Steve Dor from 1937. Uh, and you can see his facility with the form is really spectacular. As we have Boxer from 1942. This is one of his more famous pieces. And I just love the way that he elongates the human form. And you can tell exactly what it is, but it's still a little stylized. Barté left New York at the height of his career in the late 1940s and moved to Jamaica. Though soon forgotten by the New York art world, his career flourished on the island. Two decades later, he went on hiatus to Europe, living in Switzerland, Spain, and Italy over a five-year period. It was during this time that he created The Awakening of Africa in 1959, uh, again, one of his more famous pieces. His attention to detail on the human form and musculature is really wonderful. 
Impoverished, aging, and unwell, Arte returned to the United States in 1977, where he settled in Pasadena, California, and befriended the actor James Garner. Garner became a faithful benefactor, supporting Barté financially and assisting him with copyright issues, eventually establishing the Richmond Barté Trust. Uh, he died in California in 1989, but his work continues to inspire many Black artists today. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the Carl Van Vechten Man About Town exhibition and these little looks into his portraits of artists. Thank you so much.